I'll do then. I'll hand over to you. Um, take it away whenever you're ready. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, it's fantastic to be here and um, thanks so much for coming along tonight. Now, I'd love to hear where everybody's coming from. So pop in the chat, um, in the chat box. We're all so familiar with Zoom now. Let me know where you're coming from. And I'm I'm in, as, as um, Tam was saying, I'm from in sunny Hampshire today. So it feels quite nice, quite a novelty to be able to say it's sunny Hampshire. Um, and uh, so, yeah, let me know in the chat who's here, where are you from? Um, and and as we go through, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen with you in a minute and talk you through what we're going to do in the session. Um, and then um, pop any questions in the chat as well as we go. And um, and then I will either pop back to them or answer them as we go. So we've got somebody from Kent. We've got Wiltshire. Where else are we? Denise from Wolverhampton. Oh, brilliant. Bassett Law. Oh, I don't know where Bassett Law is, Kat. You'll have to let me know which county you're in. My, my UK geography is terrible, I have to say. Um, I don't really have an excuse for that. I did live in Melbourne for 10 years, but... I was an adult, so it's not an excuse for not knowing my UK geography. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you and we're going to be talking about the power of the pause. Now, um, really, this is about managing stress from the inside out. And we're going to be talking a little bit about meditation and mindfulness, but hopefully in a way that uh, makes it feel accessible in, in a way that maybe maybe it hasn't felt for you before, maybe it's something that you use already. So I would love to know, um, you know, as we get started, um, you know, what your experiences are with meditation and mindfulness. So I, I promise I'm not going to keep asking you to pop things in the chat box, but I will ask you in a minute just to pop in there, you know, what you, what you, what you've experienced with meditation and mindfulness, um, whether that's nothing, it's really new to me, um, or you've got some experience, I'd love to hear from you. Our Robin Hood country is Bassett Law. I used to live in Nottingham, actually. I, I should, I should know that, shouldn't I? Because that's Nottingham way. Um, so yes, let me know. Now, what we're going to be talking about is, and I'm going to share a quote with you here to really sort of set the scene for why it is we're talking about pausing and why it's so important. Because uh, I think probably for most of us, this last 18 months has been pretty frantic and full of all sorts of emotions. Um, um, this quote comes from somebody called Viktor Frankl, which if you've come across him before, he was a psychologist um, and Holocaust survivor. And he became fascinated through his Holocaust experience with why it is that some people survived and some people didn't. You know, what was it about their state of mind that enabled them to come through the really worst horrors imaginable whilst other people crumbled? And he talks about this, this space. So between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And this space that we're talking about here between something happening and you reacting to it, that's what we cultivate through meditation and mindfulness is, is the ability to have that pause button. And we're gonna talk about three things to do with that. We're gonna talk about how that becomes the antidote to stress. You know, what exactly does that even mean to have a pause? And we're also going to touch on the inner critic because one of the ways that we can experience stress is actually internal. We have the external stress of things that happen to us, the events of our lives, but then we also have an internal stress of the way that we talk to ourselves and the way that we respond to things. And then we'll touch on the science of uh, and mind skills that you can use. So just some really simple things that you can use to create that pause. And it doesn't have to mean uh, finding lots of time. And, and I'm, I'm sure if you're like me, you've got busy life and having lots of time is something that is a bit of a luxury. And so knowing that you can actually achieve what I'm talking about here in, even if it's micro moments in your day, makes it more accessible. So we'll talk about how to use some of this stuff in your actual life. You know, the one where there isn't enough time that you're, you're stressed and overwhelmed and you, it's just a struggle to do the things that really matter to you. So before we dive in, let me know in the chat, um, you know, what is your experience with this? Anybody got any experience with, uh, meditation with mindfulness or with stress you know let me know um, pop whatever in the chat box and let me know where you are at with it and then in a minute I'll just share briefly my story of like what's you know how I came to be doing this stuff um, and if you're not feeling very chat boxy tonight that's okay too um, I'm happy for us to just crack into the content and and see where we go so um, it doesn't look like any messages are coming through at the moment, so I'm going to carry on. Now, 
a little bit about me and as I said it, sometimes it just can be helpful to um to understand you know why it is that I'm I'm at this stage so I can and, and maybe you can relate to some of the things I experienced so my journey with meditation uh, in particular started around seven years ago now and it actually started with three words because I sat down and I found myself writing in my journal and I wasn't much of a journal writer uh, but I found myself writing the words I am nothing and when I felt, when I, they, those words, you know, I felt them and, and when I wrote them, I felt them as if they were completely true. You know, at that moment in time, I was feeling really overwhelmed. And if you'd know me at that time, you would not have thought that that's how I was experiencing. And I don't know, maybe you can relate to that, that feeling of inside, there's something really different going on to what other people are seeing. So, you know, I, I had had a successful corporate career and then I'd moved to Australia with a young family, young children, and that kind of loss of identity took me to that place of even though externally I was project managing a house bill, I was working for a charity, I was really involved with the kids' school, I was doing all the kind of mum stuff that we have to do, um, I had really lost track of me and who I was. And so, yeah, and then I stumbled across meditation and it wasn't a magic bullet that, you know, suddenly I started to meditate and hallelujah, all my problems disappeared. But instead it was the scaffolding really that transformed how I experienced my life so that I could do things differently. So essentially I created that ability to create a pause button between me and the things that were happening. And I went on to then study meditation and mindfulness and I kind of followed that breadcrumb trail really. And I became really passionate about making it accessible because some of this stuff, um, you know, it, it can feel like it's it's only for people who are, um, you know, on a mountaintop or have got lots of time or, um, you know, the, the, it's it's just not something that that works in a busy, stressful life. And um, and and so that's really why I'm why I'm here today to talk to you about how you can build this into your life and, and hopefully it can make a difference for you. Um, now. Dawn meditates daily, not always successfully. Now, it'd be great, actually, as we go through to um, talk about what we mean by successfully, too, because I think that's the other thing with meditation. There's a few ways that, and I certainly know for me, that you, we think of meditation and mindfulness as, as these, you know, that it can feel like we're not very good at it, especially if you're somebody... I'm a real chronic overthinking kind of a person. And, and so the idea of having to enter my mind can be uh, making me feel anxious in itself. But before we do any of that, I think it's probably worth us just having a little experience. So just to spend just a few minutes and there's no sort of special postures or anything that you need to do other than just, um, we're gonna do two things. So we're gonna think about in terms of posture, we want to find a middle space between active and relaxed. So for this type of practice we're going to do, we don't need to be kind of lying down, super relaxed, because we want to be able to stay connected. But we also don't want to be kind of concentrating and holding on too tight so that we're kind of rigid. So finding that middle place. And then the second thing is that with your thoughts. Now, when you close your eyes, if you're a human, you will have thoughts coming along and you don't need to empty your mind. You don't need to get rid of the thoughts. You actually, the only thing you need to do is notice, just notice when they come along and, and then just come back. And actually we'll touch on this. We'll talk this through, but the, that is the practice is the noticing and coming back. Um, and so even if you have to come back a hundred times, you're still practicing. Uh, so we're going to gently close down our eyes if you feel comfortable doing that. You can also just keep your eyes, your focus soft if you feel more comfortable with that. And just gently, just allow yourself to land right here. Now, just notice even now as you close your eyes, noticing your feet on the ground and your hands in your lap. And so often we're rushing to get somewhere or reach some goal and for now, we're going to do the opposite, just moment by moment, turning inwards. And I'd like to invite you to take your attention to the very tips of your fingers. So without moving your fingers, just let your full focus rest there for a moment. And you might notice with your attention on your fingertips, that maybe there's a gentle humming or buzzing in the fingers like a vibration or humming. And if you don't feel anything, that's okay too. Just to keep your attention on the fingertips. Maybe you notice thoughts and sensations elsewhere in the body. And that's okay. We're just trying to keep our main focus on the very tips of the fingers. 
We're not trying to make anything happen. We're just noticing. And then seeing if you can add your toes to your awareness. So now your fingers and your toes are in your awareness. And maybe your mind's wandered and you need to bring it back and that's okay too. Perhaps you feel that same gentle tingling in the toes as the fingers. Maybe you feel it more strongly in the fingers. Maybe more on one side or the other, just notice. And just allowing that awareness to spill across the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And allowing it to spread up your ankles and your shins and your calves. Traveling all the way up to your knees. Coming back if the mind wanders. And traveling up the thighs and into the hips. And just noticing the weight of your legs. Maybe there's a heaviness or a lightness to the legs. Maybe you're aware of the chair supporting you. And noticing the lower back. Traveling up spine and the belly, noticing the rib cage, maybe even noticing your body breathing as you're paying attention to your body, noticing your chest, your shoulders, and allowing that awareness to travel down from your shoulders, down your tops of your arms to your elbows. Be noticing the feel of your arms against your body. Feeling your hands in your lap. Your whole body in your awareness now. Just noticing how that feels. And if the mind is still wandering, that's okay. There's no forcing or trying, just gently come back. And noticing your face, your jaw, forehead. Maybe there's a feeling of relaxation just beginning to emerge. Just allowing whatever you feel. And if your mind is still wanting to wander away, just gently coming back and setting an intention to be right here for this next period of time. I'm exactly where I planned to be. There's nowhere else to go. There's nothing else to do. This is it. This moment right here is all that matters. It's all that's real. And gently returning movement to the fingers and the toes. Just noticing how it feels to move again after being still. Maybe letting the shoulders move. And allowing your chin to just drop down towards your chest, letting your head become really heavy. Just letting your chin drop down towards your chest. And with that heaviness of the head, back of the neck, just allowing your vertebrae at the back of your neck to open. Letting the head be super heavy. And then gently letting the head be really light now, letting the head come back up above the shoulders, imagining that it's full of air like a balloon, but even feeling as though you're a little bit taller just because your head's lighter. And then gently blinking open your eyes and just keeping your gaze soft for a moment. And just noticing how you feel if you were able to follow along with that practice and if not you can always do that as you watch the recording and if anybody wants to share in the chat box or even out loud um you know anything you noticed as we did that then um, then feel free to share sometimes if there's something that you've noticed then other people will have noticed the same so it's and and, mm -hmm. and it's always good to just yeah share how you feel now i'm just gonna share my screen again with you too Now, as I said, we're going to be talking a little bit about stress, which is kind of the opposite of where we've just been trying to take ourselves out of that stress place and just notice where we're at in our body. 
And when we talk about stress, where there's, we, there's inner stress and outer stress, which is kind of what I touched on at the beginning. So that external stress we're all really familiar with is that the financial pressure, relationships, work, children, the pace of just the modern life, really. And, and perhaps over this summer, you know, maybe things have slowed down or maybe you've got kids at home and it's made a real juggle or, you know, maybe it has been quieter and, and now you're facing into like September's coming. Maybe it's going to be busier and things are going to start picking up again but chances are there are things that are you know that's that feeling overwhelmed is something that is a kind of is, is something that you're experiencing in your life right now um and and Kat says she feels no to be more settled it's interesting isn't it Kat because actually we only have our eyes closed for less than five minutes so it just goes to show actually that that um you know surprising how how things can shift um but we're gonna talk more about why that's the case in a little while um so with our with this inner versus outer stress the inner stress that we have is the stress that when we're harsh with ourselves now when our self-critical mode is set really high which for many of us it is it's like having that stress response turned inward on ourselves so is anybody here in fact drop me a, a message in the chat if you have a very vocal um, voice in your head that tells you when you're not good enough, when you're not doing enough, when you should be handling things better, when you're judging yourself for how you're doing things. Let me know if you, I know I've, I've suffered from that voice in the past. Let me know if, if you have, have that. Oh yes, says Melissa. Yep. It's that kind of almost like having, instead of having a, a cheerleader in your head, it's like having this inner critic in your ear telling you, yeah, Stacey says always, yeah, yes, Valerie. And, and sometimes that can make, you know, that makes handling all those outer stresses even more difficult. Um, and so definitely, I'm very quick to criticize myself. Yeah, and, and it's this, we, we're so quick to do it. Now, there's a whole range of reasons why that's the case. And, you know, we don't have enough time in this session to go into to all of that. But what I really want us to, wanted to share really is around with this, really understanding that when we when we have that inner critic voice that we all have when we turn that against ourselves we're actually triggering we actually triggers all the same things in our body as external stresses so it, you know being able to um to, to manage that is actually just as important as being able to manage how the outer stresses do yes yeah, feel guilty if i don't keep up with people and pressure myself yeah it's crazy isn't it there's the sort of um you know that pressure of I need to be doing more, I need to be achieving more, I should be getting more done. And that adds to that overwhelm beyond the actual situation of what we've got to get done. So we have that fight, that self-judgment of, you know, that voice saying, you're not doing well enough. And that is like this fighting with ourselves. And then we have, you know, if anybody experiences this, the feeling of isolation, you know, that you, you almost run away, you almost feel so embarrassed about how you're handling things or how things have gone, or you said something that hasn't gone the way you wanted it to, and you feel yourself withdrawing from people and, and sort of that flight, that running away, or freezing, you know, being stuck in rumination, you know, overthinking, and really it's almost self-absorbed, you know, like that some, you have a conversation or an exchange with somebody and suddenly you're playing it over and over in your head. Um, but I'm going through a very turbulent time and I have continuous conversations and arguments in my head to do with the situations I'm in, a constant monologue. Yes. And like when you feel you constantly say the wrong thing. Exactly. And then we end up adding to that. So we say the wrong thing, something doesn't go right. And then we have this overlay of the things that we say to ourselves. And it's it's a horrible, it's a horrible place to be. And it can make it so, you know, even no matter what's going on outside of us, we can have this going on inside of us. And so when we understand that actually what we're creating with that is a stress response um we we it's important actually then it can be really useful to understand what's what happens with that stress response how can i interrupt it how can i create this pause so that it, so that even when that voice shows up i experience it differently and modern stress in this in our in our modern world is very it's very toxic uh because it, our nervous system only has two tracks. We're either in stress response or in the relaxation response. And we actually evolved to be in the stress response for only around 15% of the time. So our primitive self, you know, might have been chasing for a kill or dealing with a tiger on the horizon. But then we'd switch back into the relaxation response. And we'd be in the relaxation response for around 80% of the time. Whereas now in our modern world, it's been completely turned around. 
And this last year, especially for many of us, we've actually been stuck in the stress response. So if anybody's anybody, has anybody found that they find it really hard to relax over the last few months and this last year, even when they get to the relaxing time, they can't switch off. Then if you experience that, they feel really restless and like they're kind of stuck in doing and in, in kind of being busy. Um, what that that's a sign of being in stress response too much and we become it becomes really difficult for us to then make the leap to being relaxed uh, and says yes for the last few years actually and and it can become really chronic and this is where we have this a chronic stress where we don't have anything that interrupts the way that stress is impacting us and it has a really big knock-on effect to our our whole health our whole sort of system and when we do meditation practice even like that tiny practice that we did just now what we're actually doing is we're turning that chronic stress that kind of almost virtually constant state of stress we're interrupting it and creating these little breaks that turns it into a series of acute stresses instead. So instead of it being one continuous band of stress, we've got this interruption. So and, and that doesn't sound like much because our total stress load's the same, but actually physically, right down to a cellular level, the way it impacts us is very different. So if we find ways to do this regularly, we actually then we experience you experience there's a whole range of research showing the, the benefits of doing it but you know, somebody said here my sleep is extremely disrupted too yet yeah, sleep is a real casualty of being in this chronic stress because we you know if you imagine you're trying to go from being in this go 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 mode to being able to stop and it's just very difficult it's like trying to rip the handbrake on and expect to be able to go to sleep so we're going to talk through and actually one of the side effects of these kind of practices is actually improved sleep um, in the moment, you can use it to help you get to sleep, but also the, very, the practice of regular meditation actually improves your capacity of sleep. And we'll talk a bit more about why that's the case in a little while. Um, so the first thing meditation is actually doing is just, as I said, switching us out of that stress response. But that doesn't necessarily mean it, make it feel relaxing. Not always. Now, maybe some of you did feel relaxed um, during that five minutes that we had. But maybe some of you found that you actually just noticed how busy your mind was. Does anybody have that experience where it was like, wow, it's really busy in there and, and they struggled to slow down? Yeah, no, you, you're not alone. Um, so it can feel like go I'm rubbish at this I can't do meditation you know that's this isn't working for me now I like to use the analogy and I've got very high-tech teaching aid here which I don't know if you can see the light it's my snow globe here now for most of us this is what it's like in our brains you know that if you imagine the snow is our thoughts and in fact it's more like this um you know that it's just does anybody feel like that that their bright their mind is just 100 miles an hour with the snow now when we first stop and we stop to meditate we start to start so does start to settle but the first thing when we first stop what we're actually aware of is the snow is how much snow there is and and it takes a while actually before that snow settles and it doesn't mean that it's not working until the snow settles because actually it's already it's already starting and it's already making a difference and when when the snow does settle we get two qualities that emerge and the first is that there's more space you know we've literally got more space in our minds and there's more clarity we can see things more clearly and that's where we get this pause we get this spaciousness to do the pause and you can think of these practices and i and i love this quote from daniel goldman who's a um he's a, an author and psychologist and he says just like going to the gym and working out you get bigger muscles and more strength the same thing happens in the mind the mind is a gym and meditation is a workout so when we close our eyes and we slow this down, we're training this capacity to do it because actually the more we do it, the easier it becomes for us to just notice the snow and notice it settling. And I've got my other sort of high tech teaching aid for talking about this. What exactly are we doing in the brain when we meditate? So when, you, when we did that practice and we closed our eyes for five minutes, what are we doing that's making this clarity and this space? And, my next sort of teaching in fact I'm going to turn my slide off for this because 
I can show you my hand a bit more. So if you imagine this is my brain here, um, and I took my daughter for a, a manicure the other day for the first time because she wanted to go, and it was a special treatment. So she made me get these bright yellow nails, okay? So I don't normally have bright yellow nails, but today I have bright yellow nails, so thank you to my daughter. Um, and, um, and so if you imagine this is my brain, and so this, this, lowest, this lowest part here would be like the brain stem. So this is like my base of my brain. It's the very primitive part of my brain, and it's where all the survival stuff sits. So it's where my heart rate gets gets controlled, my breathing, um, and it's also where fight, flight, freeze, that stress response sit, which that one we talk that can get triggered by the external stuff, but can also get triggered by the thoughts and the thinking that we have. And this primitive part of my brain, the only part I have control of there is actually my breath, which is why you often hear people talking about breathing, because when we when we slow down the breath, we actually send a message to hear that things are okay, which is why it works. But then the next layer up on my brain is my um, limbic system, it's like my emotional brain. So this is like the reptile part of my brain. This is like the mammal part of my brain. So it's a little bit more evolved, but it's still very reactive. And so when we're acting from here, we haven't got much of a pause button where things happen and we are reacting and we're, we're instantly responding. And there's two little almond shapes that just tucked underneath here called the amygdala. Um, don't ask me to spell it because it's quite tricky one to spell. But the amygdala's job is like the alarm bell. So it's literally scanning the horizon, looking out for tigers. And when it sees a tiger, it sends, it's like a sort of little alarm bell, sends the alarm down here to the fight or flight response to say, guys, we need, we need some action. And it's this alarm bell that is the faulty part in our modern life. So we have, it's like having a, a, smoke, a smoke alarm going off when the toast burns, that we're kind of constantly triggered notifications on our phone um you know, emails financial stuff kids you know i mean it's almost like everything in our modern world is designed even looking at your instagram feed is kind of a trigger for this fight or flight response whether that's the the fight or flight response of oh i'm not good enough look at what everyone else is doing and i'm not or it's that fight or flight response of you know something's actually happening that, that we need to be worried about and even if it's the events in the world right now which are worrying so this faulty smoke alarm is the amygdala. And then the final layer is the thinking part of my brain. So this is the most evolved part of my brain. And the very tips of my fingers, which for me are now this funky bright yellow, are this is like the prefrontal cortex so behind my forehead, where that, um, this is my, sort of my brain CEO, if you like. So it's that ability to see the big picture, to self-regulate, to emotionally regulate. And this is this is where our pause button happens. This is where something happens, that pause button Victor Frankl talked about, you know, we have a stimulus, so something happens and then we get to choose our response. Now, this is in a kind of tug of war with the amygdala because when the amygdala goes and tells us there's an alert, it actually disconnects us from this part of our brain because actually if there's a tiger on the horizon, I don't really want to be thinking like a CEO and doing a business case analysis and thinking, should I go left or should I go right? I actually just need to react. So the more often we're in this fight or flight response, the less able we are to think clearly and think from that place. Now, if anybody's ever had that scenario where you're in a really, really emergency, you know, and you kind of go, oh my God, I can't think. You know, you literally just think your brain just, freezes anybody had that experience is that just me um you know where you just go oh um and that's because you literally cannot and if anybody's got a toddler you know what it's like when a toddler loses it because they kind of you, know, you can call this the thinking cat and there's some great videos on youtube about this actually brain is hand and you can talk to them about their their thinking cat pops off and they're obviously more prone to it but so our, this amygdala is, is disconnects us from here, but it also does a couple of other things which are worth noting um, before I talk about how the good news, which is what meditation can do for some of these areas of the brain. So when this alarm bell goes off, it, it, obviously we know about the big guns of like adrenaline, cortisol, things getting your heart rate going, getting you ready for action, which can be toxic for our body when we're in that stress response all the time. But it also down regulates a couple of systems as well, which is really significant. So so the first one is our, our digestive system. Now, we talked a bit about sleep. I don't know if anybody has any gut issues with stress. Maybe have any IBS or, you know, just like sort of difficulty with the digestion. Now, when if I um, if I when this alarm bell goes off, 
if that was for a tiger on the horizon, it makes sense for my digestive system to be down regulated, to not have as much energy or blood flow. Because um, if I'm going to be a tiger's lunch, I don't need to digest mine. So it was a really adaptive thing, like let's keep all our energy for survival. But obviously when we're in that stress response suddenly nearly all the time, that impacts on our gut. And 95% of the serotonin, which is that feel good chemical for the brain, is produced in the gut. So our ability to emotionally regulate then gets compromised. And then we find ourselves reaching for the chocolate bars and the, the things that kind of quick hits to try and get that feel good. So, um, so being in a stress response has a big impact on everything. And then the second one is our immune system. Because again, if I'm gonna fight for my life with this tiger, I don't need to fight off for cold. And uh, if anybody's ever gone on holiday and found that that's when they get sick and we had that experience before, you know, that's the moment when you get sick is because your body is finally going, oh, right, now we can get the immune system back online and it can deal with all of those things. So this amygdala is pretty important and stress, managing and regulating our stress is actually pretty important for so much. And then how does meditation fit in with that in this pause button that we're building? Well, the two areas of the brain that have been shown to, two of them, there's a lots of areas, but two really big uh, components to what meditation is doing is the first thing is it down-regulates this amygdala. And in actual fact, it even makes it reduce in size with regular meditation practice because we're literally training our brain in those five minute bursts, 10 minute bursts, even just a few moments actually has been shown to, to accumulate. We're actually getting rid of that reactivity, you know, that kind of something happens and I have to respond. Um, we just dampen that down. So this becomes less trigger happy. So we're not triggering the stress response as much. And one of the first things actually people often notice with meditation practice is that is that is the kind of go, wow something happens and you think wow I wouldn't have I would have reacted so much better and in fact for me one of the first measures if you like of oh this is actually working was from my daughter actually she said to me she must have been about five or six at the time and she said to me oh mummy I like it now that you're not shouting um and because you know it's like kind of dagger in the heart moment it's like oh god you know because I you know when you're in that place I don't know if anybody relates to this you know when you're in that chronic stress it's really hard to be the kind of mum friend you know anything or work colleague because everything's reactive and your child does something and you just ah um and and you know being able to have a pause button so you know she could you know, not have got her shoes on for the 50,000th time. And instead of yelling, I was able to, I'd be able to go, I think that's really annoying, but I didn't have to react. You know, that's what that pause button gave me was that power to do that. Um, and then um, the second area that gets impacted is this, this brain CEO, this prefrontal cortex. And actually what it's they've shown in research is it actually thickens. So the layer which conducts the signals, the myelin layer is thickens which means, and then that the act, it activates more across both hemispheres. So effectively, it's literally, you know, when we get that quote about it being like a gym and working out a muscle, this is the, this is the bicep curl that we're doing is that, so when I said at the beginning that when we did a practice, the only thing you needed to do was notice that your mind had wandered and bring it back. That's the bicep curl for this part of our brain, this focused attention of um, I've been distracted from where I want to be and I'm going to come back. And when we do that in meditation practice, we cultivate that skill and that ability and that strength to do that in our daily life so that we are more able to stay focused on what we want and we are more able to choose how we respond. Um, so the combination of slowing down this, this, this trigger happy alarm bell and thickening and making the signals work better in this part of the brain means that even with a very small meditation practice, that regular practice, you, you actually change, you fundamentally change the structure of how your brain is responding, which is kind of exciting really when, you know, if you can fight, if, you know, because that's something that can make such a big difference. Um, so, when we think about, you know, and I'd love to hear actually, because I've talked, we talked for a long time there about this stuff. And I'd love to know, is anything kind of resonating for you or anything that you, any kind of ahas or, or anything that you think, mm, I'm not sure, pop it in the chat and, and let's kind of talk it through because this is, it is a big topic, but it's also, it's a really simple thing meditation. But it's also a really difficult thing. Um, and I'm going to just bring my screen share back on for you. 
because I think we probably it's probably worth us having a little chat to your inner critic again this this voice inside that that maybe for some of you uh I know this is certainly what, what happens to me is I hear about you know something like this and you think yeah that sounds great but my inner critic has a field day with all the ways that yeah that's not for you you won't be able to do that um and and so you know these are the sort of four most common things that come up for people of you know why it, this is too tricky or might not work and the first one is i don't have time um and again you can either raise your hand or pop a, a, a something in the chat to let me know if that's something that that pops up for you if i don't have time you know i've already got way too many things i'm having to do i'm trying to you know yeah hand one hand up there you know i'm, I'm already trying to juggle so many things this is already really difficult i haven't got time for one more thing well the good news is that all these things i've talked about with the the benefits you can get they can actually come from really small amounts it's actually just the consistent it's, it's more the regularity rather than um how long you do it it's a bit like it's very similar to physical exercise actually in the sense that um, you don't have to be a marathon runner. You just have to, you know, go for it, start with going for a walk, you know, that actually going, going for us, doing a small amount every day is actually better than, you know, maybe once a fortnight, you know, sitting down and trying to meditate for two hours, you know, or the same way you wouldn't go to the gym, you know, once a month and think you're going to get six pack. You just wouldn't. Um, and Tamsin definitely never seems like there's enough time. No, exactly. And, and what's really interesting, and this was definitely something that I noticed and people talk to me about is that when they find ways to when they make that commit a lot of it's about making a decision but also um you know when you start to do this suddenly you find time feels different um and um jen says yes it's all resonating one thing that struck me that i've heard elsewhere too is about stress and the impact on gut digestion and bloating can you expand on that and possible solutions please yes i'm going to come back to that actually i'll come back to it and make sure we cover that properly my mind is not too busy it's switched off okay interesting yeah um and that can be that that's one worth exploring too and i'll well, maybe we'll come back to that actually um hormones just before that time of the month i consciously struggled to keep calm and collected yes and actually it's really useful for um hormone regulation actually because um one of the things that in fact i did a talk with uh, uh for a nutritionist and we're talking about we're talking about hormones because um one of the big impacts on hormones particularly if you're a woman and you're in that especially if you're in that going through that sort of perimenopausal or menopausal stage i'm in sort of perimenopausal stage myself um stress has a massive impact and your ability to regulate your stress has a massive impact on your hormones sends them haywire so uh, meditation is a really good complement to anything else that you're doing with your um with your hormones and managing them um so that's that i don't have time barrier uh, my mind's too busy is another one and um this one especially for me like i as i said at the beginning i'm i was always and i'm still really prone to being an overthinker you know that's just how i'm I'm, I'm wired and I used to feel like there was no I didn't have any choice about that there was nothing I could do but actually um and but being kind to yourself and really acknowledging that that's okay like that's just the experience that you're having um sounds it sounds really um like how can that make a difference but actually when you know that you don't have to empty your mind and you know that actually thoughts can show up and it's okay uh, actually it changes the experience so when you know so for example if, if anybody found that you know knowing that they didn't have to get rid of the thoughts maybe it actually it allows the thoughts to just kind of go on their own now there are other techniques that we can use that we use so this this practice we did was a very basic one but there's practices you can do we actually really cultivate that ability to let thoughts flow through in a really different way so you change without having to get rid of thoughts it's like if you think back to the snow globe we don't need to get rid of any of the snow we don't need to challenge it question it get rid of it we can just change our relationship to it so that it doesn't have as much impact as it did when it's like this um and i don't know how and that's what's really really useful to know is that you can just keep it really simple so even even for example just connecting to your fingertips you know when you sit down at your desk just kind of tuning into your fingertips for a moment actually that counts as a meditation it's because meditation is really just a quality of attention it's a it's a choice about where you place your attention and how you use it so keep it simple and make it work and we're going to talk in a minute about making it happen in your life and how to do that and the final one it's not for me now for a lot of people you know meditation can feel a little bit woo-woo a bit kind of 
spiritual or it can feel a bit too um, much of a process they have to go through. Um, but knowing actually that there are ways to make meditation accessible for you. And, and, and I'll share with you some resources that um, can give you access to lots of different ways of, of doing meditation. So you can experiment. It's a bit like um, if I said to you that, you know, you can only do this one certain type of exercise this certain way and you have to do it that way for the rest of your life. The chances are you'd be like, no, I'm not doing that. And it's the same with meditation, actually, that there are lots of different ways and keeping it interesting and keeping it um, uh, um, fresh is actually really important as well as, as much as having the consistency making sure it's still in, interesting and engaging is more likely you're more likely to actually be able to do it um, now I'm going to come back to that one about the gut stress and the impact on the gut um, so with all the things so with like your gut health with it like the, the impact on your gut the impact on sleep um, the impact on um, mood regulation those are all um, those are all there's two ways that meditation can help with those um, and M. Um, Sue said I like to put on sleep meditation this is especially good if you have trouble dropping off as a PTSD survivor it's worth making that time it may seem a little odd but it really helps re-engage your sympathetic nervous system to recover from stress yeah absolutely so that's one of the ways so the two ways that you can use meditation to to help with all of these things is the first thing is you can use it in the moment. So in that moment of feeling overwhelmed. So for example, if you suffer from anxiety, if you suffer from um, you know feeling like that in the moment overwhelm, or you're in bed, you're lying, and you just your mind will not switch off and you can't get to sleep, um, or you are experiencing discomfort in your gut and it's really difficult. You can use meditation in that moment to really tune into exactly what your experience is right now. Um, for example, with gut health, there's a, very, there's a few different ways that I work with people to help with the gut with meditation. There's different ways of, but all of it comes down to connecting to your body actually, and being able to feel what's going on. Because a lot of the things, a lot of the experiences we have are about that takes us out of our body into our mind or distracting ourselves from things that are happening, uh, the things that we're dealing with. So you can use it in the moment. You can use it, like Emma Sue said, at bedtime, putting the headphones in, listening to meditation to help you sleep. So that's one way. It's almost like, you know, applying the Band-Aid in the moment. But you can also, with, with if you can build a regular meditation practice, and I'll, as I said, I'll talk about some ways you could think about doing that. Even if it's just five minutes a day, um, most days, um, you... The, 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 it's a bit like if you think about having a balloon, a stress balloon. So every day you're filling, we're filling that balloon with stress. And over time, it just gets more and more full. And we do things, maybe you go for walks or you do yoga or you spend time with friends or you do things and it releases a little bit of stress, but you never quite get to empty with that stress balloon. You know, that we never quite, the, the, the equation isn't, we're always putting more air in than we're releasing. And with what meditation does is it allows these little, it's like a way of just releasing air from that, that stress balloon each day. And over time, you start to get rid of the old stress too. So, you know, you, you, I mean, when I first started meditating, I was actually suffering from quite high levels of anxiety. And when I meditated, I would actually feel a lot more of my anxiety. I would actually feel, in a way, I felt worse when I first started meditating because I was having to feel the things that maybe I hadn't really made space to feel before. But over time, suddenly you're just release. you're just kind of keeping that balance and getting rid of the stress as it comes in. Um, and so you find that then your sleep improves as a result of that, because you're not getting to bedtime. It's like, it's like the equivalent of we get to bedtime and it's like, you know, when you let go of a balloon and it flies across the room, you know, that's what kind of happens when we get to bed and we haven't had any way of processing stress. So um, a regular meditation practice will uh, improve because you're because you're getting rid of that longer term stress in your system. Does that make sense? I don't know if that answers your question. Um, so let me know if there's anything else you would like to, to know about it. And somebody said here, my mind's not too busy, it's switched off. So I'd love to know a bit more about um, what, 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 you, what would help you in terms of understanding that, if there's something about that that you didn't like, or if that's something that you tend to find. So just, yeah, maybe give me a bit more information. And we can touch on that a bit more. But let's move on to making it happen. So I love this quote from Deepak Chopra. He says, the best meditation practice is the one you actually do. Now, I don't know if you've ever sort of seen those things that tell you, you know, you should be 
you should have this miracle morning where you do this and you do that and you should be exercising this amount of day and you should be doing this and meditation can get added to that list of things that you should be doing and uh, and we and especially that inner critic voice can be quite harsh with what you you know trying to make you do things now if you're somebody like people say to me what's the best time of day to meditate well, how long should i do it for and you know for me what works is getting up early and doing it before everybody else is up because i tend to find that and that's the time of day when I wouldn't be doing anything else. Um, but if you're somebody that has little people waking you up at the crack of dawn, that's not going to work necessarily. Or if you're somebody that needs six snoozes on the alarm before you can get out of bed in the morning, again, even if you're able to use willpower in the short term and go, right, I'm going to make myself do this, it's not sustainable. So a really great start is to look at your day, look at your um, day and see, you know, where do I already have things have, have opportunities where I've got this time now a good a good measure of that is when do I already have scroll time so when do you know that you tend have a tendency to scroll on your phone you know is it while you're having while you're waiting for the kettle to boil in the morning is it kind of you know when you're sitting in the car uh waiting to collect the kids from school or is it is it you know when you're just get home from work and you just stood in the kitchen not quite ready to start your evening yet um, is it when, when you're putting the kids to bed or waiting to put the kids, you know, just have a think, when in my day am I already sort of almost, there's a, there's a craving there for some sort of escape. Um, and that's usually a clue of a time when you could use it. Now, for me, there's some really sort of, maybe not what you'd necessarily think of for meditation. So I think sometimes when we think about meditation, we think about having a special cushion and a beautiful candle and, you know, having this beautiful experience and great when we can do that. But it also, um, you know, when you're on the dog walk, finding somewhere that you can stop and sit and do a meditation for a couple of minutes, or when you've dropped, um, if you've got kids and you drop them at school, one of the things I used to do is when I got home from dropping the kids to school, I would do a meditation in the car before I went in the house, because I knew that once I got in the house, I would just do the dishwasher, I'd just send my email, I'd just do this, and suddenly it'd be, oh, I don't have time now for that. Um, and the other thing I would do is I would set, um, I would set my sort of, you know, you have that kind of default time that you know you have to be out the door, otherwise you're going to be late. And for me, it always ends up being a last minute scramble of, oh God, I'm going to be late. Um, but I always end up being just about on time. And so I would just, in my head, when I was, when I had, had a school pickup, I would just get there a bit earlier. So I'd have 10 minutes in the car and I would meditate in the car before I pick the kids up. And I would be a very different mum uh, when I, on the days that I did that than when I didn't. And it was a very short, a short period of time. Um, but they noticed and I noticed the difference. Um, although one day I did park too close to the school and it was I was living in Australia. It was about 38 degrees outside. So I had the air conditioning on the engine on and I was just meditating in my car. And then I heard these voices outside the window. Is she all right? And a couple of friends had sort of seen me sitting in the car with my eyes because I thought there was something wrong. So they kind of were tapping on the window. So maybe park a little bit further away if you need to do that. Um, and um, some people said, that's why I scroll. It's like an escape, though an unhealthy escape. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? I mean, bringing a bit of kindness to ourselves about the scrolling, you know, that, that you know, these, the device, our devices are designed to do that for us, to, to, to suck us in. Um, and so, you know, but if we can, it, it, and actually some scrolling is useful, isn't it? I mean, it's useful to find really cute cat TikToks. It really is useful sometimes. Um, but it's just, no, it's getting that fine line, isn't it? Of when am I doing this? And it's a healthy diversion. And when is it tripped over into being escaping from something? And and this this sort of taps into big, this is a, a much bigger piece of of self-discovery work um that that i you know i have a, a program a be more program which is about doing that that journey really where we start to get a bit deeper on some of this stuff but essentially where you have that scroll time if there's a regular spot you you know i'll share and i'm going to share with you there's an app called insight timer and you can find meditations in there so actually you know while you've got your device in your hand you can actually use um, and in fact, if I find, if I can show you the app, what it looks like, um, it's like a little bell there, if you can see that, it's like a little bell, and it looks like this when you, oh, I'll just open it up, it looks like, when it opens up, it looks like this, I've got mine set to the timer, so it looks like this, and you can actually search me in that app, and there's, so the, app, the meditation that we did together, 
is in there, that five minute one. Um, and there's various other ones in there as well. Um, um, but, and the other thing you can do, so in this mind skills training that I've got here, you can actually, there's a five minute meditation download. So you can download that into your phone and literally have that ready to go in your phone, make it really easy for yourself. Um, and in my free Facebook group, I have various meditations. So every Monday I meditate, as you can see there, um, to anyone can join when you get a replay. And within that, it just gives you something that you can almost, you've got somewhere to go to get it. Because I think sometimes the idea of just, I'm just going to sit for five minutes and do nothing. It's like going from going down the fast lane at 19 miles an hour and then suddenly pootling along on a country lane. It's too much of a shift. You know, we need help sometimes to just change gears, change lane and kind of slow down rather than expecting our crazy ass brain to just somehow screech across all the lanes of traffic and get to the calm. So those are just a few places to start um, where you can, where, you know, might be useful to. And the great thing with the Insight Timer app is that, that where I mentioned before about keeping it curious and really exploring, you know, what do I like? Is so it, there's it's like there are so many different meditations in there. You can search by, you know, I've got anxiety. You can search by I want to go to sleep. You can search by all sorts of different things, um, and so it's a great resource um, in there. And I also have a YouTube channel as well, which you can you be more than meditation. So you can also look up meditations in there. And of course, like you can join my membership community as well, um, where we meditate twice a week live, and there's a whole meditation library of all sorts of meditations for. Like today we're meditating how to be your ally and we we're actually looking at how we um we can sometimes almost gaslight ourselves with feeling like we should just think ourselves out of feeling things and actually just creating space to feel them instead so as, as, as you can hear i'm a really big fan of using meditation to really improve not just feeling relaxed in this moment but also improving and changing how we experience things so i'm going to finish on a little quote and then if anybody has any questions or things they want to ask then then um, please do feel free to ask so mindfulness helps us get better so mindfulness is kind of the byproduct of meditation really it's it's a way of experiencing things um, and it helps us get better at seeing the difference between what's happening and the stories we tell ourselves about what's happening. Stories that get in the way of direct experiences. Often such stories treat a fleeting state of mind as if our entire and permanent self. So that idea that, you know, sometimes when we get caught in our head and we get caught in, um, you know, that that story about, oh, no, that person's thinking this about me or like, a lot of that is just stuff that is manufactured because we're stuck in our own head rather than in the moment exactly as it is. So there you go. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And if anybody has any questions, um, please put them in the chat. And there's a whistle stop tour there of uh, how you can create a pause button.